love this vocal music thing. It's just, it's just it feels great. energizing. Yeah, yeah. So, so why did you change your shoes? So these are the Reeboks for reasonable people, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the Nikes are, they are so fast. I can kind of overshoot uh, my kind of mark. Too much off. speed. Yeah, just too much kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so these are more, these are flat. Yeah, so these nice. are more, more, more conference compatible shoes. Yeah. <laughs> Not as remarkable though. So, so, so actually, as Knut said, like we did a lot of research during the, the work with this conference and, and it's a limited amount of designers who have a lot of experience with deploying structured content. Mm -hmm. But it was also kind of interesting to talk to you because I think a lot of, you haven't kind of really down the Kool-Aid just yet. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a more kind of a typical kind of position for, for, for people to be in. And you were able to articulate some of the challenges that you would be facing in a way that actually made us change the keynote because we realized like some of the challenges are, are not really about the technology at all. They're not really about like what's possible with structured content. There's mm -hmm. something, something else. It might be even harder to change. Yeah. I mean, a change is almost always about people and their habits, right, and breaking those. So, you know, when I was hearing you uh, earlier today in the keynote and you're showing some of the examples of, of uh, Prada, and Nike, um, the question that went in my head was like, you know, design is of course absolutely capable of creating remarkable experiences. I mean, that's what we're, we're amazing at. So then why do we see examples like the Wall Street Journal or the Prada and Nike where we're seeing what I think what you call the flatness or the blandness of the content in those situations. Like how do we end up there given that designers are amazingly talented at creating memorable experiences? Mm. And my reflection on that is it's scale. So much of it is just scale. You know, if I think about like Nike as a company, you know, imagine when they had one or two pairs of shoes, 10 shoes, everybody in that company knew what the story was, knew what made that unique, uh, what made it differentiated, and how to bring that out creatively in an experience like the website. But when you start to add thousands of products or thousands of blogs or thousands of anything, any piece of content, it's the scale that starts to conflict with the creativity. Hmm. Right? They become almost at odds with each other without some sort of deliberate intervention. <laughs> so, so what would that intervention be, would you imagine? Well, I mean, when we think about creativity, creativity you know, there are a couple ways that bring out a, a remarkable experience or a memorable experience. You know, one is just a, a brand that is like particularly opinionated and is going to put out creativity no matter what, right? Because their, their whole company identity is focused on that and they excel at that. So, so it's just gonna get done. Um, but in the other case, it comes through meaning, through customer understanding. Like what matters to customers? What will resonate with them? And I think what we see at scale is that it becomes much harder for design or anyone on the team to find that meaning again, um, because that takes time. Like I need to understand the customer or and or I need to understand what my colleagues, potentially in another department, which might be very far away from me depending on the size of the company, what they believe is, is meaningful hmm. to the customer base or what they believe will resonate or change the experience or change conversion, you know, whatever we're trying to achieve. And so you start to lose that uh, as companies grow, as, in, as, the, as the number of items grow and then as the company grows. You start to lose that connection with meaning unless you go and find it. Um, and just thinking about like uh, the company I work at, Hologram, we're a very small company, but even within a small company, um, our brand studio team and our marketing team who collaborate on content together, as, when it was one person, one person, no problem, two people, two people, no problem, and then you, you get into that like three, three, right, and then you go from there, and all of a sudden, if you don't take the time to collaborate, which you've heard about a bunch in earlier sessions, it, there isn't an opportunity to understand why we're putting this piece of content out. Hmm. What is the purpose? It, should it have priority over something else? You have to spend the time 
to tr really transfer that knowledge between groups within a company. Hmm. Or go outside, you know, get outside, talk to customers, depending on sort of the medium you're working in. One may be more appropriate than the other, but you have to go and get that data and then translate that into saying, okay, now I understand the purpose of this, the meaning of this, or why this is more important or less important to emphasize, hmm. and now we can add creativity back in very intentionally. But yeah, I agree. Like the scale thing, you, when we talked the first time, you talked about like the, let's call it like the singular pages, like a landing page, mm -hmm. or like a specifically important thing, and you have the kind of repeated pages, like a product page or a blog post or something like that. Yeah. And, and of course, those will always be, there will always be too many of those. Like in the past, you would, like, you would set a newspaper and someone would actually go and design every page. Yeah. We don't do that anymore. We just give it to a template, right? Yeah. But I, and Maggie talked about this kind of range from like no structured content at all and everything being structured. And I feel like what we are arguing for is that there is like a middle ground, like there is a place for these kind of super handcrafted landing pages where every pixel counts. And then there is somewhere in the middle where, where these kind of, let's call it these kind of, these kind of repeated pages, like a product page, mm -hmm. are more different but not as handcrafted, they are driven by content in a way that makes them more different. But I think that, so this is where kind of our conversation took me like, I realized a big challenge now because I was like, of course, to me it's like, yeah, of course the content creators, whoever kind of puts it together, they are empowered with expressive tools. And I'm thinking about sanity and of course they will then create beautiful content structures. And as designers, you will make this, this engine that will kind of render that in some mm -hmm. kind of beautiful inspired way. And then you said kind of, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, one of the, one of the ways to, to add that interesting factor or the creative factor to one of those repeatable pages is, is to figure out, like I said, like what, like what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to accomplish? And if that knowledge is in the head of a content editor or content writer, right, then we need to find a way to either get it out of their head like transfer the knowledge of the why, or to your point, hand over the reins mm -hmm. and say like, here, you decide. And you can actually manipulate that directly and say like, hey, yeah, this, this, this piece of content or um, you know, has a higher priority or emphasis and here are the reasons why and, and have that power. But it goes back to, you know, it got touched on a few of the panels earlier of you know, a little bit of trust. Right, like you, ha you have to have that sense of if I, if as a designer or as an engineer, anyone responsible for ultimately like the the output, the, the experience that someone will will have on a site, uh, we have to have the trust that what's being put in or turned on or flipped on or or chosen as a featured, it's not abused, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's done in a way that's thoughtful, in a way that is true to to the customer's needs, yeah. and that takes that takes collaboration. That takes uh, really understanding roles and responsibilities and talking about the hard things about like what can go wrong when we don't have that type of agreement. So we, in the past I worked a lot with media and then you have journalists. They have a high status, they are trusted and they kind of run the show a little bit and they expect to be listened to. When you move into these fields, you have like developers, designers and some kind of content people. They don't have, even have a clear role. Yeah. And they're very often not invited into the room. And that's also kind of a repeated thing when I kind of do, do my kind of conversations. It's like, do you talk to the content kind of people during the design process? Most people don't. Like they 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 are added in later. They are expected to kind of fill in the template, so to say. Right? Yeah. And then of course there will be very little trust because they were not empowered to to kind of be a part of like defining that. Yeah. 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 That, that's a really good point, and I think we're seeing a lot, a lot of changes right now in the industry. Like as an example, like we have our first content strategist uh, on our team, and that role has been really interesting to see how it's creating the glue between those that are writing the content and should you know like have that that intuition uh, and understanding of of how uh, how important something is or how much to emphasize the emphasize how much to you know, make very meaningful versus what can sit in the background. Like, they should have a point of view on that. And what, what we're finding is that uh, our content designer is, is serving as a really nice bridge 
uh, between the design and engineering team who are really thinking about what is the structure and how do we want to um, how do we want to decompose our components and how do we want to um, lay out the data structure as an example and then our writers you know who, you know for example writing blog or need to write content within um, a landing page that sort of thing and really say like the content model is our is our language we're going to talk through that and talk about for example setting up like she has set up blueprints uh, which is an amazing tool where it's like, okay, for everything from an ad, um, a digi you know, display ad, all the way to a web page, uh, you know, here, here's, here's, what, here's our layout, and here are some common best practices uh, in terms of character length, in terms of the type of imagery, like what type of uh, photography meets our design system, and really creating a, a tool that both parties can talk to, react to, have opinions about and then agree to. Because hmm. every sin that I'm pointing out, kind of, I've, I've been guilty of. Because I feel like I've been in the past, we, before we started Sanity, we were always making, like, our framing was we as designers and developers, we are creating an experience. We are creating it, and then someone will come and, and kind of fill it with content. Yeah. And I think that one of the transitions I want to make, and it sounds like you're doing the same, is I want to think of developers and designers as someone who connects like the people who are kind of doing the communication day to day to their audience. Yeah. And like that is, we are kind of the enablers of that. Yeah, Maggie called it like a conversation. I like that, that feels like a conversation. We are just the mediators. Yeah, yeah. Just that. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I'll say this is, I don't know, a little slightly off uh, the, t the, t the conversation topic, but you just triggered something for me, which was, you know, like one of the small things that we can do to help facilitate that. Uh, we always, uh, in our designs, you can never use lorem ipsum, right? Like there's a reason for that. And I think it goes a little bit, not, not just to like, you have to understand it's not, you're not done when you've made the, the, the outline and the structure, right? It's not done until the content's in it. Because without the content, it's, it, it's not of value to anyone. And it has, the content has to shine. So we have to be very realistic about our content up front very early on in the design process and not mm. put filler in just for that same reason. Um, because it really does a disservice, uh, especially on you know, marketing sites, which is how we're, we're planning on using Sanity. At, content is everything, right? It is the vehicle to help people understand what you do hmm. um, and how we can best meet their needs. It is, it is the most critical piece. So does kind of the, we, we kind of hinge this whole thing on experiences being remarkable. Does that kind of make sense from your perspective? How do you think about that when you're kind of creating the yeah. product marketing for Hologram? Yeah, and, and on, the, on the marketing side, I think, uh, remarkable resonates, right? I, I would, it would be hard to see that there would be too many uh, uh, folks creating marketing sites to say, I, I, don't want, <laughs> I don't want my experience to be remarkable. <laughs> right? like, you have to stand out, that's your first impression often, or uh, you know, very close to your first impression. So being remarkable and feeling that meaning in connection with customers and that they could come to your site and really feel like you understand who they are and what they need and, and what they're there for, that, that matters a lot. I think What's interesting is most of my career is in product design, so more on the software side of the house. And in that sense, like, what does remarkable mean? And that, that's a whole other really interesting conversation. Um, but that idea of, like, you know, you're trying to achieve a task, you're trying to do that in an efficient way, you're, you're trying to uh, help a, a user achieve their goal um, in a pleasant, you know, effective way. Um, and when we think about remarkable in that setting, it's a little different. It's like, how do we figure out the emotional arc of that journey? Where along creating, you know, having a task being completed or achieving a goal, are you feeling like low or stressed? And when are you feeling like high, like celebratory? And finding those moments to bring remarkable hmm. out um, in the experience. So different lens, but I think we all strive as company to have some part of our experience be remarkable. Yeah, it, it kind of, of course, <laughs> I, I agree, kind of obvious, but I feel like there's uh, one thing we feared kind of going for that concept was that people would think it meant like impactful or like animated or something mm, like that. Uh. But I think the, sometimes like a documentation site can be really remarkable in its tone of voice or... Of course, So yeah. there's like a... 
I guess that's kind of, kind of the lens, like how, how, how do I want this specific experience to be? What, to be? Yeah, what emotion do you want to create within the person visiting mm. that part of the experience? That's exactly. the question. And then remarkable can look very different depending on what you're trying to achieve mm. in that moment and what the customer wants to receive in that moment. Yeah, and I think that for, for me, the one lens that are kind of, because there is, you have this kind of um, task-oriented design perspective. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm envisioning my 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 user as someone who's trying to accomplish something. But I feel when I've been designing things, very often like I don't know what they're trying to do right now, and I don't think always they would know. Like right now, I think they are like maybe if I well to sum it up, they are exploring something. Like when I'm going to hologram, okay, I have one task. I'm trying to figure out what it is. So that's yeah. one task, I guess. But also, as long as you are able to to kind of inspire me and engage me somehow, I'm still going to be there. So that's maybe maybe that's the task that I'm kind of on a marketing site. I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just. Uh, I think somebody said it earlier. It's establishing your personality if you're a human, right? Trying to create that relationship up front, and of course, you want to carry it through. You want to create that consistency of that personality throughout the entire journey, but. Marketing sites and digital ads are often the very first time you do that. Um, and so it is about making sure the right information is there, but also saying, hey, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, are we compatible? Mm -hmm. And, and then, then that goes back to something that, so, so the, the concept of kind of content velocity it sounds very kind of aggressive. But sometimes I feel, so we talk to brands using structured content to, so John Wheeler talked about being able to get things out in a day or two from InVision. Mm -hmm. And we talked to a lot of customers who think like that, and I think that also part of this kind of personhood is, is this sense of presence. Like something happens, like chicken sandwiches are sold out all over, over North America. It would be weird if our site did not reflect that in every touch point. Mm -hmm. And then being able to do that like this, and I think uh, that is something when you talk about like as designers and developers that we are doing this, there can also often be like too slow a process for that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you said that example, like I, I thought about, um, you know, several years ago, the company I was at was acquired and like we had to like, you know, instantly put a notice like on the website in the new branding of the company that acquired us. Um, and you, you know you throw that at a you know kind of traditional um, you know sort of non-automated team, and that's it's actually like a really hard turnaround mm. um, to do that. And um, and that's why I I really I, I love um, I love how how we progressed in terms of websites and what we can do. And I think structured structured content, CMS, like where it's all evolving, um, is a lot about creating that efficiency to respond. Um, by taking out the like the hard stuff and, and really simplifying, creating the structure, creating the scalability, it allows you to be nimble and be able to react quickly to changes like hmm. that, which will always be important. So one thing that I took away after our kind of initial conversation and started thinking about like these these content people or whatever we should call that, and I feel like some of that kind of lack of trust that. Like it's not specific to like you voiced it, but it's like something I see a lot uh, yeah. expressed or just kind of uh, as a bias. Uh, but I wonder if there is like if we're putting that kind of divider in the wrong place because maybe it's not between like designers and developers and then content types over here. Maybe it's like the people who work in the kind of strategic timeline, like we're making the new experiences, we are kind of thinking ahead, uh, working in a slower pace, and then there are the people doing the day-to-day -day kind of tactical operation of the communication. And maybe they are not content people, because maybe some of them are developers, maybe some of them are designers, but they work at a different kind of uh, pace. Would that make sense from your perspective? Oh, tell me more about what you're thinking there with the pace. Like so I'm thinking like uh, some of us are working on, uh, so we have a new product, so we're going to release that. So we have like a whole new documentation site coming up, and also we have like a whole new kind of sign-on process that we're working on. So that's like a strategic timeline. Like it will come out in the weeks or months. Yeah. But then uh, we have uh, these ongoing communication needs. Like we have, we realized like, oh, there is a war. So we had to change all our kind of vegetable oils 
for some different toggles. Now we have to kind of take all the product pages and we just need to update those and respond to that. And actually it's palm oil, so it's kind of also like a spin control we have to do. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of tactical time. That's kind of, it goes, goes out today or tomorrow and yeah. it's kind of, uh, and then in the traditional framing, these people are, on, their only weapon is forms. They have like forms yeah. and then some design system that kind of just because so the, they would probably go into like the description field of like 700 products and enter like a, like a information about these oils. Yeah. So I was thinking maybe we could uh, think of that team as someone who is empowered to make all these decisions, but they have all of the functions available to them. So it's not like, it's not like a separate kind of content people team. It is fully empowered. It's yeah. fully. But I feel like we, that's not how we usually organize that because we think of those as like the, the form jockeys. They run the forms. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, pace is a huge part of, of a, any successful team that's working on, in our case, a marketing site. I mean, I think what, what I took out of that too, which is so true, is that um, you know, putting, putting out, in our case, blogs or events or um, you know, any, any sort of like discrete piece of content like that, it's, it's very quick. And then there's like another tier, which is like uh, case studies, a little slower, but you know, they're still regularly coming out. And then there are core pages, plan, you know, our, our homepage, pricing page, our product page is much slower pace for change. Mm. And you do have to have a system that can adapt to that and uh, ways of working that can adapt to that and be able to meet both, like sort of both, uh, all the stakeholders who are providing input into that meet their different timelines. Mm. It's a constant, it's really a constant consideration, right? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone really pull this like off, like all of the things at once. But I, I, there was one company we worked with that, that like, I think their, their sense was like we have the social team, they work in like cultural time, like Instant. everything yeah. changes, and we kind of respond to that, and we make a joke about that, and uh, and then you have like everything else, which just moves as this kind of glacial pace. <laughs> <laughs> and their vision, and that's kind of okay, they use sanity, but but the point is that their vision was like we want all of it to work like that. Yeah. We want to be able to, like the content team should be able to impact all of our touch points at the same kind of time scale. Yeah. Uh, and I'm guessing for them, time scale is like hours, but I'm guessing for all of us, depending on our team size and what we're doing, it's, uh, it's uh, we have a similar challenges. Yeah. That, yeah. It sounds to me like it, we're very new to sanity, but it sounds like the structured content approach solves for that, right? If you have, a source of, of data that's coming in that is at that extremely rapid pace of change. And that, as a, as a type, is being used within a slower changing page as a component. Like, you get both. Like, and that's what I think what was really interesting about, about the system and the sharing of content. Yeah, I think you definitely can do that. But, but people aren't using it. That like, way. that's the kind of uh, the weird part because I think, like, we thought, like, you build it and then, like, people will just instantly understand this and they will relate and they will, oh, yeah, I know I can solve all of my problems. Yeah. But we see a lot of, like, uh, yeah, I love the headless part, yeah. which is kind of just like an enabler. It's like, a, but then, and then they basically do redo a WordPress kind of thing. Uh, we just kind of, like, we just take this structure of data and just stick it into this template and like we're done and it's awesome and they are happy and we're happy for that. But I'm very often sitting in a meeting and thinking you're not getting the full. The full value. Yeah, there's so much well, That goes there. back to people, right? Mm -hmm. Like habits are hard to break. And I, I, th there's something uh, very, very real there. And I also think going back, like you have to, it's, it's not just habits, you, you have to have a pain point. Like you have to feel an acute pain to make change. And you know, I think when you're dealing with you know, thousands of, of items within the same type, like the scale, like I mentioned at the beginning, that creates pain. Like you can't keep up with that without structuring your content. It, gets, it becomes chaos. And so I think in this case of like what's the pain that, that f would like really drive somebody to create that, that global universal content and really think through how rapid content, for example, affects a glacial paste <laughs> page. <laughs> I love that. that yeah, the experience is sometimes yeah. like you yeah. see someone with a nail through their hand and they had it for there for so long yeah. that they are not even realizing that they are in pain. They and, and I think yeah. that the, the, the specifically this is about like you, <laughs> you're seeing some 
uh, let's say like there's a team running a marketing site mm -hmm. and they have all of these uh, beautiful like blocks that are supposed to kind of compose and they can move them around. And they have all these design considerations. Let's say like if you put this next to that, you have to have a specific divider and they kind of give the content editors, mm -hmm. the editors the power to kind of run all of that. So now there is a gazillion ways that the content team can kind of break this site. Whereas all of these things are rule-based, like you could yeah. program all of that in the front end and they would just be able to move things around and the thing would just solve itself. Mm -hmm. But they're so used to thinking, yeah, we can give like the color choices and everything to the content team and that would be awesome. And now everything is just kind of broken and slow and they are super afraid to change anything because every time they do something, it kind of becomes ugly. Yeah. So I think that is the kind of the challenge to, to and, and, and that's where I also wonder it seems to me like designers have to be a little bit more like developers and developers have to become a little bit more like designers because so so this is also part of the research we come, had a conversation with a friend of ours who he used to be kind of a, uh, an artist working with algorithmic art so it's like if there is one designer who would have like figure out this because he's now uh, a front-end designer with like a more traditional consultancy like of course he will have this figured out yeah. And we talked to him and he's like, and he basically echoed what Carrie is saying, it's the handoff. Like I can't hand this, like if it is algorithmic, if I have loads of rules and stuff, the developers just becomes angry, angry with me because now I can't kind of, kind of fully define this thing. It's kind of now, it's a kind of a machine. It's a kind of a design machine. And then we would have to collaborate, but, but I have to hand off like a wireframe mm. to them and they will have to code that. Yeah, yeah. So there is some, there is some very deep-rooted... Uh... Well, and, and maybe like what I'm hearing from that too is there, there's been a huge trend in design from more, let's say, bespoke, um, one-off, very individualized design to systems design. Mm -hmm. And we see that with, with the emergence of design systems. And so part of me almost thinks like, like this, is, this is that next step. Yeah. And it really just takes a different type of designer to see that, to be able to really appreciate the value of it and understand like how in, investing in, in thinking through uh, the content just like we do components in a design system, like thinking through the reusability aspect of it, like how it creates such tremendous, like, cohe like so many benefits, tremendous cohesion, tremendous efficiency, and, and actually tremendous control, right? Which goes back to that, how, like, don't make, my, don't make my work ugly, right? Like, fear. A design system helps there. Structure content helps there. But you have to have a designer who's a systems thinker, yeah. who's thinking long term and thinking about how it will scale with the, with the organization. Yeah, exactly. Like John from Invision talked about this kind of having a, 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 like a design that responds to the content. Mm -hmm. I think his example was about like the length of a title. So like yeah. maybe change your layout a bit when there's a long title and make it just work. And I feel that's kind of, we've been through this change once before. We had like responsive design. And I remember the first time I saw that, but like designers are never going to go for this because this is yeah. like, you're so used to deciding all of that. Like, were you, were you how was it? Was your yeah, I, well, exactly. And, and responsive design was, is an interesting when coming back to like, when you, when you have a change in an industry, it comes from, a, from hitting a pain, hitting like a dead end. And responsive design did that to design. Like you pull it up on your phone and like, it fundamentally doesn't work. Right, like you, we had to solve that. We had to like create that collaboration and create um, the system around responsive design. We're doing that with design systems, and this this is the next this is the next hmm. wave. Right, is really like harnessing data as uh, content as data at scale. Hmm. So now I'm doing some market research uh, with you right now oh, okay. because like this is like, because I feel like uh, uh, I've. Uh, I feel this is, we needed a new kind of designer at that point. Designers evolved to yeah, someone who makes rules time. about design. Yep. And then, so I thought like maybe we could call this thing content responsive design. Do you think that would work? Hmm. I don't know. The responsive part, oh, I mean, I hear what you're saying, right? Because huh? what you're saying is that you're saying, hey, you know, I'm putting, I'm putting the same content in different contexts and I'm adapting the way that it, that it looks or behaves 
to provide meaning mm -hmm. like, or, or remarkableness to a particular uh, part of the experience. And that would be, that's the responsiveness of the content. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. like, like uh, Carrie shows the IKEA page and I was thinking like, let's say you have a super simple product. This is just like a, like a little knob that you put on your, like, like a spare part. So it has almost no information. Yeah. So like the responsive thing to do is to just show like a huge image of that little knob and some technical mm -hmm. information. But then you have this chair that has like loads of contextual images and is linked to loads of products and there's like a story about uh, this line, the story of materials. And then instead of having it like a designer design each specific kind of page, you'd have several rules that would then respond yeah. to the available content and try to make the kind of yield an appropriate design. Yeah, you're saying like, hey, I, I'm perceiving, the system is perceiving through some information that this knob is sort of unimportant on its own, right? Like it kind of needs to live with some other products yeah, to like and have any like value to the customer. It's an opportunity for us yeah, as, as a designer yeah. to just like, give it like some space to breathe. Yeah. Maybe it's like the most beautiful page on the whole site actually, because it's just this single knob and the name of that knob which is like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can't probably respond well on the naming idea, but the concept of it I think is, is, is what's really, uh, What's really interesting, and like I said, feels like it is that next step. Once we get through and structure the content, it's like, okay, now what? Like, what can we do with it? And just like when we think about, you know, the design system, you've got the rules, great. Like step one, you know, in the structure content, you have the content, it's structured, great. And then it's like, now what? Where do we inject their creativity? Where do we uh, intentionally break the rules, and for a good reason? And with that, that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs>